Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back. And in this video we're going to work on Old Sporty. And we have done already a lot of work on this vehicle. We already fixed a lot of the brakes, we replaced the brakes, we rebuilt the calipers of the brakes themselves. And then we took out the engine because there was a problem with the clutch. We changed the clutch, the pressure plate, a lot of bearings and a lot of seals even on the crankshaft so we can avoid any oil leaks. We put it all back together and then we adjusted or we replaced the timing belt and we also have rebuilt the carburetors on this vehicle which were DCOE 40s from Weber. Now those are newly baselined, newly rebuilt so they will go on this engine in this episode or in this video. Meanwhile I already placed the engine back into the vehicle and there are a couple of challenges. And the first challenge I'm having is the cooling system because we do not have a standardized cooling system on this car. It is coming from different vehicles, donor cars. So as such, I cannot use standardized or ready available cooling hoses. So we'll have to make our own. And then we'll install the rebuilt Weber carburetors. We'll align them statically. We'll connect the linkage to it. But we'll also connect the fuel lines to it. But before we do so, we will actually check the fuel pressure. But of course, we can't run the car without an ignition system. So we're going to change the old distributor with an electronic distributor and then make sure that the timing is right. The clutch cable that was on this vehicle was really bad, loose, and it could catch on anything on the road. So we have to put a new clutch cable up. I don't know exactly which one I have to use. And then we have to make sure that the clutch is adjusted and that it's, the cable is properly attached. And then if we're a little bit of lucky, we could start up the car and give it a try. Now the cooling system is the major issue. I have a radiator from a specific car. I think it comes from a Ford Capri. And then I have the engine, which is sitting in the engine bay. But of course the standard hoses between the radiator and the engine doesn't match up. And that's what they had in there before, this kind of weird looking flexible tube. The biggest issue with this one is that it is very long and uneven at the inside. So, you know, the kind of rings that you see on the outside, they also exist at the inside. And that is going to give a lot of resistance and turbulence in the water. So it really isn't very good for your cooling system. So I am not going to use this. Away with it. So instead, I'm going to use silicon hoses. And these are silicon hoses, but I will have to build, of course, uh, a certain shape for that tube because it's not a straightforward connection. Now you can have straight tubes like this and, and they come in all different sizes and this is silicon stuff, really good stuff. And then you can get pre-shaped corners uh, of all kind of angles, 90 degrees or 135 degrees and even pieces that are converting diameters. And then you have nice aluminum connection pieces and then you can just connect it very smoothly together. But even where you connect it together, whoops, you know, it, it, it's very smooth inside. You see how nicely that connects together. So for me, this is a, a good solution for bespoke cooling tubes. Now, uh, some people will say, well, I don't like this. There's too many connections on it. Yeah, you're probably right. And then you could get your custom hose built. Uh, they do that for you, but that's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And I think for this vehicle, this is probably the best approach. And I've been using this before. So let's have a look for the top hose on how we're going to build that and then have a look at the bottom hose, how complex that will be. All right, so let's start with the uh, top hose and see how easy that is to build. That's the easiest one to build. The one on the bottom is a lot more complicated and a lot more curves and angles to sort out. So the first hose is the one coming from the thermostat going to the top of the radiator. Now that is not gonna be that difficult to build. So I think I can use a 90 degree angle and a 135 degree angle to create this. Let's have a look uh, if we were to place this on there and then do the other connection right here. I think that will fit. And then of course we lift it up and this should go down. So I think that way we could probably cut it and get it done. Um, this may not be 100% a fit, but let's give that a try anyway. In each case, I don't want to come up too high, so I want to come up like maximum this height. So I need to cut this off around in this area. So let's do that first. And this is how the hose will look like. And I've created it from a 90 degree angle and a 135 degree angle, like so. 
easy. And all you need to do is cut it with some sharp cutters and you can easily build this up the way you want it. So now let me take this apart real quick so you can actually see it a bit on how it's built. And in here we have the connection piece. So that's all what we have to do. Place it in there, hold it a bit so it doesn't slide. Of course you have to put the clamps up and then hook it up and then try to twist and turn it a bit until you have a nice flush fit. And that's it, there's nothing more to it. Now I'm going to put the clamps up, but to do so I'm going to do it outside the vehicle and I'm just putting some tape up so I know exactly how that needs to align. Okay, so we've got things put together slightly and now we can hook it up again and see how well it all fits. Uh, that should go over there. And this spanner, I need to move that up a bit. And now I can actually tighten up everything and we should be good. And that's the first connection, all done. And I think that looks quite all right. Now, the bottom hose, that's a complete different story. To run the hose, I need to start at the radiator, then make a bend, try to get in between the steering house and the chassis, or over it, then get over the oil cooler, get all the way in the back, and return back to the water pump right here. So that's a lot of bends, so I gotta figure out what's the easiest way to do this. That wasn't all that hard to do at the end. I did a little bit by little bit, and as you can see, I'm now able to run from the radiator. I'm going up at one piece, two pieces, three pieces, and four pieces all the way back to the water pump. I know it's about one, two, three intermediate connections, um, but that's what it is. Uh, but then again, these connections are very smooth inside and the coupling pieces, they have ribs on it, so it's not gonna slide open. But we'll figure that out very soon once we put the uh, cooling liquid into the engine. It was a very close call in certain areas, and, and here I don't have a lot of play in between the belt and the hose, but I think it's going to work, and, and we'll find out soon enough uh, how that runs after we've done a little bit of a test ride and check the hose after that. But it's about the only way I could route the hose through the system. So now we're going to fit the clutch cable, and this is the old clutch cable. And as you can see, there's no adjustment on it. The new one, on the other hand, has a nice adjustment. Uh, so we need to fit it. Um, the problem was that I didn't know exactly what cable to get, so I got a Ford uh, Escort cable, and that seems to be fitting. Now, I will have to route it along the engine and then to the back here. Now, the old cable, when it was in there, it was actually uh, hanging loose like this, so you could cut it with anything. So what I will have to do with the new cable is, once I have it installed, um, I'm going to make a bracket here uh, so that it doesn't drop down unless it would stay up by itself once it's fixed here. But I'm not sure that's going to be the case. So i rather make sure that I tie it down somewhere. It doesn't really wear. Maybe I can even do a bit of tie wrap over here on the chassis. Something like that. But I have to do that. And I have a second problem on the connection right here. So fitting the clutch cable, I need to gate it through this hole here and then lock it into the uh, lever where the tow out bearing is on for the clutch. And the problem I'm having is that I can't lock things down because I can't get a nut on this side. This ball here on the top is too big to get the nut off. Let me show you. And I want to lock this in place. I don't like this uh, to be hanging loose. so. Uh, I might have to do some jiggling with it. All right, so see, I can't get it past this piece of metal there. So I'm gonna take a little bit off that hat here and then that should be okay. I'm uh, Not too much because I don't want to lose too much for the grip here. So let's have a look if that will work. So here we are, I grind it off a little bit on the head. Not too much, enough uh, to get the nut over it. Oh, come on. There we go. Now I can feed the cable through the hole. Uh, use my nut on the other side. And 
then I can actually feed it in the lever and then tighten it up. And that's what I wanted to do. So this is now more solid and I can really adjust the clutch. And I still have sufficient material here so it doesn't slip through. And the alternative would be to cut a part out of a nut like this so that I can actually slide it over the cable. So if I do this, right, like so, I can actually push that over the cable and connect it. Now, of course, you have a gap on the nut uh, and it all depends on how much strength you have to put up. In the worst case, you can even weld it up. So I think in my case, I'm going to go for the split nut. Uh, I think this is the better solution. So now I'm going to install the clutch cable and I will do it without the gator first because I want to see how far this lever goes. I don't want it to be pushing slightly onto the springs of the pressure plate because the throw out bearing is not built for that to rotate the whole time. So I want to have a bit of slack on it. So if I'm putting my cable up first without the gator, I can really see it and, and feel it. And then I can actually um, mark it how far I need to adjust it. So this is the way I'm going to do this. So the gator is going on later. Okay, so uh, let me put things together a bit and slide it through. Now remember, I'm going to go for the split nut option because I like that better. So here is that nut. So we're just going to slide it over and I can always weld up the gap, right? And now I can nicely adjust this. Don't know yet where it has to go. Uh, I will first now connect it on, on the top of the vehicle and then see uh, how we need to adjust the clutch. So adjusting the clutch isn't very hard and it depends a bit on your specific vehicle. But on this vehicle, I wanna make sure that the pedals are aligned so that the pedal is in the right position. And for that, of course, you need to look at the inside of the car, which I can't show you. Uh, but I can see it through the hole here and I can see that it's pretty well aligned. And I want to make sure that I have a bit of play. So I don't, I don't want to put tension on really um, to the lever on the gearbox itself for, to engage the clutch because otherwise I'm going to keep pushing all the time that throw out bearing against the pressure plate and I don't want to do that. Now this feels quite all right. Um, of course the final adjustment you have to do that while you're driving it but this feels okay. So let's have a look underneath and then we put the gator on and then we should be done with the clutch for now. So let's have a look underneath the car. I have adjusted the bolts already, uh, so I have a bit of play. You see that here? That's the kind of play I want to have. Now I'm pushing against the pressure plate, but I want to have that little bit of play at least. So that's a good start. Uh, I'm going to keep it like this. So now I'm going to put the gator on, spray a bit of anti-corrosion on it. That's always helpful. Oh, because this piece here is always suffering a bit. It's going to slide in and out. That should just fit. And let's try that out and move it in here. That's a bit of fiddling, but that will work. It's always good to have some long nose pliers to pull that through the opening. There we go. And that feels good. All right. And now that's it. Now we need just to push it in place. That's a tight fit. There we go. There we go. Now that's all set and this feels good. So now I still might to fix the cable to the carter because it's still hanging a bit loose. So now with the clutch cable in, uh, we would have to do a test right, but we can't because the engine isn't running yet. Uh, but we'll do that afterwards and do the final adjustments if we need to. But the problem is a bit that this cable is a bit loose and I'm afraid if you're gonna, you're gonna drive that it's gonna come down and it's gonna be caught on something, something you don't want to. Uh, so I'm gonna need to hold this up somehow in one way or another uh, so that it can't come down. Now, there's a couple of options I have. I can weld a bracket on here, um, or I make brackets on the side. Uh, I think welding a bracket is probably the fastest way to do it. So let's see what I have available to do that. So I think I'm gonna use this type of uh, bracket. It's a small light bracket, and I'm gonna weld it 
onto the vehicle. So I need to mark it off so I can at least clear up that area a bit. <laughs> Welding the bracket onto the carter was quite easy. So all what I need to do now is just put a few rubber grommets in on the left and on the right just to protect the cable a bit and then just push the cable in and off we go. We are all done. So I think that worked out quite nice and now at least the cable is secured. It is time for the exhaust and um, I don't have an exhaust manifold as you normally would expect but I have individual pipes that I need to route through the engine bay and then back out on the side and they all come together in this side pipe here and this is a typical side pipe that you would see in the uh, late 70s and 80s um, so uh, let's start doing that and then after that uh, we'll start to work on the ignition system so uh, the first thing as always is getting new gaskets and fit it onto the block uh, that's important so otherwise you may get leaks and I don't like that and they are not expensive so you might as well do that from the start each time you remove the exhaust manifold and that one seems to go on a bit more difficult but no not really it's just me not doing it right okay so uh, let's get the first pipe pipe number one goes up and I'm just checking to see if uh, it doesn't touch anything, but that looks pretty good. And I'm just going to put a bolt up just to hold the pipe a little bit in place. And now I'm going to fit the other pipes one by one. And I actually wrapped them up uh, for heat protection in the engine bay. It makes a huge difference. And now it's time for the side pipe. Now that's going to be probably be a little bit of fiddling. Get him in deep enough. All right, that looks about right. And those pipes are actually inox pipes, so um, they will never rust. Now, I think they are pretty much okay. Uh, there's a bit of play on this, of course, now, but I haven't bolted them down, so let me bolt them down. I don't think this is going to be really uh, gas tight, so not quite sure what I'm going to do with this, but. That's how it was, so I'll probably keep it that way. And then replace them to torque. So now it's time for the ignition. And here you have the old ignition coil and the old distributor. Um, very manual uh, with breaker points. And of course the old uh, distributor head with the old cables. Now all that I'm going to replace with a new distributor and this is the new distributor but this one is an electronic distributor. In other words the breaking points are replaced by electronic switches. It has no vacuum uh, and it's a uh, 12 degrees advanced static so that's what we have to set up on the vehicle. And it comes with a new coil from NGK and of course the connecting cables. So that's what we're going to fit now and of course at the end we'll fit brand new silicon power cables and of course blue because my theme on this car is blue so let's see how we're going to do this so the way i'm going to install the ignition system is by first of all removing the valve cover so i can check that cylinder number one is at top that center at the same time i will be checking that my crankshaft pulley is at 12 degrees before top that center and the marks are on the pulley so that is quite easy to verify and then I will insert the distributor on the side here and making sure that the rotor arm is pointing to cylinder number one. 
I'm going to lock it down slightly and then I'm going to connect all the cables back to the ignition coil. We have still to fit the ignition coil, of course. We'll connect the high tension lead from the distributor to the ignition coil and we'll also connect at least cylinder number one spark lead to a spark plug. And I'm having the spark plug outside uh, resting on the bare metal of the engine so it should have a ground connection. And then I'm going to slightly rotate back and forth that distributor until I see the spark happening on my spark plug. And that will assure me that I have the correct 12 degrees advance timing in a static mode. All right, so we removed all the bolts. Now we should be able to lift that off. There we go. So I'm going to rotate the crankshaft in its normal rotating direction. And I removed the spark plugs to make it a bit easier. And I'm going to check until I'm at top that center for the first cylinder. Now you see the intake valve closing. So now that means I'm getting close to the compression stroke. And I see the marks on the pulley. And I am as good as top that center now. So this is really top that center for cylinder number one, which is obviously not where I want to be. I want to be at 12 degrees before that. So before putting up the new distributor, it's always good to check if it's the same as the old one. Now, the bottom part is the important part, and I think those are exactly the same. The top part is slightly different. That I don't worry too much, but it is important that they are exactly the same dimensions. And they are, because um, sometimes things do vary. So um, I'm going to grease up oil, the new one, and then we'll put it in. So let's see if we can get it in. And I'm not too much worried about um, the exact position of things uh, for the moment, but I'm going to try to have my cylinder number one pointing in this direction because that's where it typically is. And then we're going to try to push that in. And you can see while you push it in, it's going to rotate back a bit. And now I can lock it in place. And as you can see, we have ample of play to adjust it, right? Have a look if we can get the cap on. And the cap is also keyed. So let's try that. And there we go. That's how the cap should go on. And now it's sitting correct. And... This should be cylinder number one, and that's about right. So we're good. The next step is that I'm going to lock it down a little bit, and then I'm going to cable it up. We'll install the new um, ignition coil, and then we're going to try a few things. So now we're going to install the new ignition coil. And this ignition coil does not require a ballast. So you've got to make sure that on the positive side, you actually have 12 volts. If you do not have 12 volts, then you have to remove the ballast resistor. That is somewhere on the vehicle. I don't know what this vehicle has, uh, but we'll find out soon enough. With the ignition turned on, verify that you have 12 volts arriving at the coil because that's going to be necessary to drive the electronic ignition. So let's measure that out and see. So I've got 12 volts, 36, but that's okay because I have a fully charged battery. So that is good. Now, if you don't have this, then you need to remove the ballast resistor that may be in series with that coil. Now, the next step is to hook up the connector, and that is also keyed, so you can't miss. There we go. And then the other side is going to go to the coil. Now, on the coil, I have a positive side and a negative side. So, the switching lead, which is this gray greenish one, is going to go to the minus. And the positive side, the red one, is going to the positive side of the coil because that solid state switch device that is inside the distributor uh, requires power. So that's why you need to tap it from the plus 12 volts. Best thing to do is to turn off the ignition if you're doing this work. So not that it's going to hurt you, but it's better to do so. All right. So that's hooked up. I, I will tie them up later once we have it all tested out. So we know where the position is of the rotor and now it's time to put up the distributor cap and again that is keyed so make sure it's in the right direction 
So what I can see is that this is going to be my cylinder number one, right? Because that's where the rotor is pointing at. So keep that in mind that you don't miss that. It really doesn't matter which pointer you have, as long as you know which one is what. There we go. And now we're going to hook up the high tension leads between the distributor and the coil. And then we'll take one lead, go into a spark plug and see if we can generate a spark. So, uh, let's hook that up. And hopefully that's this side. And it is. There we go. And we'll hook it up to the coil. Yep. And now we're going to hook up one more lead to a spark plug and we're going to give it a try and see what happens. And believe me, I have not tried it before, so this may or may not work. I have hooked up a spark plug and now I can actually rotate the distributor a bit to see if we got sparks. Did you see the spark? So I'm going to turn and then stop as soon as I see the spark. All right, so that should be about it. Now the rest we're gonna check with the running engine. And the valve cover is getting a new seal. It's always good because I don't wanna have leaks. And the old seal was a bit worn out, so. So we adjusted more or less the static ignition and it's a bit more difficult with an electronic distributor than with a point-based one because a point-based one is very easy to have the spark jumping at the right time. Here you have to have a little bit of motion to see it. Nevertheless, um, it worked and we'll do the fine-tuning then later on. Uh, but right now uh, I placed back the valve cover and now I'm going to install the um, high tension leads for the spark plugs. I already have a couple of them on and these are silicon-based types. Click, and the nice thing about it, they all have numbers now, so that's neat, isn't it? The Ford engine has a 1342 ignition sequence, so the rotor turns clockwise. So cylinder number one, now we need to have cylinder number three, and there's a three on here, so that makes it very easy. Three, 42, so four, And that's it. So we are about ready to mount the carburetors, but before we do so, I'm gonna measure the fuel pressure. Uh, for the Webers, the maximum pressure is about four PSI or 4.2 PSI. And I have a pressure meter hooked up to the fuel hose. And over here I have my fuel uh, pressure regulator. So I'm gonna to try to set it up to four, around 4.4 PSI. It's gonna be a bit difficult because my dial isn't that sensitive. So, and the pressure is really low, but we'll still see it. So I'm going to give you a close-up on the dial so you can actually see it uh, while I'm adjusting. And then it starts to build again. And I think this is about right. So I'm going to keep it there. Hold that in place and lock it because the fuel pressure is now set. So let's fill up the engine now with cooling liquid. I have the cooling liquid here and I hooked it up to my expansion tank with this blue hose. And the principle is that I'm gonna use a vacuum inside the engine to suck in the fluid. And to create that vacuum inside the engine, I'm gonna hook up my shop air here and then it will come out. It will create kind of a Venturi effect. Of course, I need to close this valve here so I don't suck up the cooling liquid. But in other words, at that moment in time, I'm going to suck out, because of the Venturi system, all the air inside the engine. It's going to create a vacuum. And once I have sufficient vacuum, I will close that valve up and I open up the other valve, which will then allow me to suck out this cooling liquid right into the engine. This is really good because it avoids a lot of air pockets. So let's hook it up and see how it goes. And you can see how the needle is already pointing out, sucking out air in the engine, and it's gonna keep going up and up until I am way up. So I'm gonna close it. And now I'm gonna open up the other valve to let the cooling liquid in. And you can see how that actually is already filling. And just let it go and run now until it's all finished. 
Okay, so the meter is at zero and the cooling system is now completely filled up. And finally, we can install our carburetor. And first of all, we're going to install the mishaps, which are these seals that are absorbing the vibration because Webers don't like vibrations a lot. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And then we'll install the carburetor. And here is number one. Let's see if it fits. There we go. I've installed the carburetors onto the intake manifold and I installed the linkage, but I haven't done any adjustments. The installation of the Webers onto the intake manifold, that you can see in the video on the Weber carburetors part number three with all the anti-vibration parts. I have not done any adjustments or calibration or anything else on these carburetors. They are as they came out of the rebuild, as you could have seen in the previous episodes of the Weber rebuild. So now uh, we're going to try to crank it up. We have already preset the advance to 12 degrees uh, statically. So uh, let's crank it up and see what it does. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys, uh, I have cranked it up already once because um, I had to prime some fuel. Uh, but besides that, I didn't do nothing else. So I have hooked up my strobe light to my first cylinder and we're going to check now the advance first. I want to have it at around 12 degrees uh, running idle. And if not, uh, then we'll adjust the distributor and then we lock it in place. And after that, we will do maybe a little bit of work on the carburetors and do some tuning on that one, if time allows. And then I might do another video uh, really about the tuning of the carburetors on the road test, but I can't test it on the road yet because I don't have a license plate to drive and I have no private road to test it on. So let's try and crank it up. All right, so let's see. That is running pretty rough if you ask me. So let's check the timing and see how accurate it is. I don't know about the carburetors yet, but we'll check on that, how much vacuum they are stuck in each one of them. Wow, we are really retarded now, don't we now? So let's adjust this. See how retarded it is? So we are really late on the ignition now. Now, it looks like we are running at a at top that center. I'm going to change the uh, distributor a bit, so I hit 12 degrees advance. And this is about 12 degrees advance, because that's the markers we made on the pulley. And now we are spot on, so let's check it again and do so, make sure it's exactly at 12. All right, so hopefully you saw um, the marks properly and what is a bit weird is that I got suction on the first one but no suction on the second carburetor. Which is kind of awkward. So. Uh, there still must be something wrong with the carburetor, so now let's turn off the engine and have a check. The first carburetor has proper suction, but the second carburetor doesn't have any proper suction. Pretty weird, uh, so we'll have to do an inspection to see how that happens, that we have no suction on this one. So I'm going to adjust a little bit the carburetors. I'm adjusting the mixture screw for the maximum RPMs from idle. That's about it. I'll do the other one. All right. So I guess this is about as good as I'm going to get it for now. And let's see. The 
is now running on idle and it's fairly stable. So when we started the engine initially, it was running very rough and that was with the default settings. We didn't adjust anything, just some static ignition. Then I corrected the ignition to about 12 degrees advance and we were pretty close, but somehow, I don't know what happened, I was still about 10 degrees off. But once we adjusted that, it started better, but still it did run fairly rough and the engine was shaking. So then I checked the carburetors and the first thing I did on the carburetors was to check that the progression holes were actually not opened up yet and for that uh, I adjusted the linkage and the butterflies a bit and you can see that actually in the video where I'm rebuilding the Weber's in part number three on how to adjust that but even that wasn't working 100% I noticed that the carpets were not having the same amount of vacuum and I couldn't really tune it it didn't really help if I was turning in or out the mixture screws and what happened was is that and here they are, this is an idle mixture screw, is I got new screws and they're not the same as the old ones. It's a different shape. Apparently there are two types uh, for old and new. And I haven't paid attention to it when I was rebuilding the Weber carburetor. So I fitted back the old ones and now I was able to adjust the idle mixture. And now the engine is running really well. You could see how stable it ran. Uh, the valves are still making a little bit of noise, but that's going to be for next video on how we're going to adjust the valves. I've got an RPM of about a thousand RPM, which is okay for that engine. The oil pressure is good, about three bar on idle. Temperature is 70 degrees and steady, and I've been running at idle for a while. And engine oil is around, let's see, uh, almost 70 degrees centigrade as well. So all by all, this is working pretty well. And the exhaust is ha still having a little bit of an opening here or there. I need to check where the pipes are coming into the main pipe. Uh, but besides that, it cranks up nicely and I think it's going to run pretty nice. Of course, we still have to do road test and further tuning on the carps. I still have to put the ear horns up. I have no ear horns yet. Um, so, but all by all, this is working pretty well. And I have tried as well, actually, by sitting in the car if the clutch is working. And that is also working. So all by all, this is working pretty well. And in the next episode of Old Sporty, we're going to take it on a road test, further adjust the carburetor, make sure everything works fine. But we're also going to adjust the carbon dioxide because I have to take it to the control technique. And as it is right now, I'm not sure it's going to pass. But these are all measurements we'll do in the next episode. Well. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys, as much as I did. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.